see students from my class, so we'll try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Welcome. We're going to try to do this without microphones. I know I can project. I'm assuming that Dr. Rosenfeld can. Um, I want to welcome you. Uh, my name is Dr. Randall Osborne. I am a professor in the psychology department here at Texas State. I'm also the one who sort of generated the idea for our undergraduate minor in forensic psychology and convinced the criminal justice department is a good idea. So um, it's through that undergraduate minor in forensic psychology that I have worked to uh, bring Dr. Rosenfeld to campus. Um, before we start, I did want to uh, do a couple of announcements. There is a class coming in here at 10 o'clock, so we have got to be out of here at 10 o'clock. So um, Dr. Rosenfeld will wrap up at about 9.50 or so, and we'll, we'll need to, to, to exit the room fairly quickly so that the next class can come in and get set up. I want to um, welcome our San Marcos, San Marcos High School teachers and students. Thank you for being here. Okay. Um, and those high school students will be staying on campus to visit with Dr. Rosenfeld um, after his presentation. If we could meet downstairs or out in this outer room here and not in this room so that the next class can come in, that would be wonderful. And we're going to take you over to Old Main and um, there's a room in there where, where you'll be able to sit down and have an informal conversation with Dr. Rosenfeld. Um, I want to extend a special welcome to, the, to um, uh, those students who are not in my forensic psychology class, um, who were, are meeting over here instead of our normal classroom. Um, and if there are students in here who have um, uh, been promised extra credit by their professors, we'll pass around a sign-up sheet. Uh, please print. Print your name and the professor's name so that we can read it. We don't want to give your extra credit to somebody because we can't read oh, someone else because we can't read your name. Um, want to introduce our special guest. Dr. Rick Rosenfeld is Curator's Professor at the University of Missouri-St. Louis. He's also the current president of the American Society of Criminology. Uh, he's the author or co-author of more than five books, more than 61 professional journal articles, and more than 25 book chapters. And I was doing the math and he secured over a million dollars, I stopped at a million, over a million dollars in grant funding for his research on crime in America. Uh, pretty amazing. His research interests include the social sources of violent crime, crime statistics, and crime control policy. His current research focus focuses on explaining U.S. crime trends, and um, this morning he'll be speaking with us on crime and the American dream, which is something that students in my forensic psychology class will recognize. So uh, since we have a short amount of time, we'll go ahead and get started right away. Let's welcome Dr. Rick Rosenfeld. Thank you. Um, I appear to be overdressed. <laughs> Excuse me for that. I want to thank you for uh, showing up this morning. I know your spring break begins next week. At least the university student spring break does. Uh, so I appreciate uh, you delaying your vacation just a bit to uh, come listen to me early on a Friday morning. Um, Fifteen, actually more like 17 years ago, I uh, wrote a book with a colleague of mine, Steve Messner, and we titled the book Crime of the American Dream. And I want to talk with you this morning about some of the basic ideas in that book. Um, what we set out to do in that book was explain uh, the comparatively high rates of crime in the United States compared with uh, other societies that are somewhat similar to the US in other respects, other developed societies in the world. So European societies, Japan, Australia, Canada, and so on. Our crime rates, especially at that point in time, in the late 80s and early 90s, were considerably higher than uh, the serious crime rates in those other societies, in most cases. And our task in this book was to explain why. So let me situate the kind of explanation that we're pursuing in this book and contrast it compare it with the explanation that you psychologists typically pursue when you're interested in a topic such as crime or criminal behavior. Next, next one, please. In this, in this book, uh, and in much of my work, my interest is in learning about the reasons why crime rates may be higher or lower in entire groups whole societies compared to other groups and societies, or why crime rates may go up and down over time, relatively long periods of time, within the same society. So our interest in this book is not, first and foremost, 
to explain why a given individual may be more or less likely than another individual to engage in criminal behavior. That's the primary focus of much of the work that psychologists do on crime and other aspects of human behavior. That's not the primary focus in this book. In this book, what we, do, what we try to do is tie patterns of crime to the basic characteristics of whole societies, that is, to social organization. So let me spend a few moments providing a vocabulary for understanding the aspects of social organization uh, that might have particular relevance to crime, okay? First point, though, is our primary focus is not on why Jim is more likely than John to engage in criminal behavior. That's a very important question. That's the question that um, is of primary concern to many psychologists. That's not the question of primary concern to us. Our concern is why, on average, crime rates in the United States are elevated compared to other societies that are like the U.S. in other respects. If you think about social organization and how it might be related to crime or much else we might want to explain, I think it's useful to divide it into two general components. We can talk about the culture of a society or group, and we can talk about a group or society's social structure. Culture has to do with values, beliefs, goals, rules. These are, so culture has to do with what we believe in, what we place high value on, and the rules we use to guide behavior. Social structure has to do with the positions and roles that people occupy in a given group or society. Right now, we're occupying relatively distinct positions and roles. Professor, student, guest speaker. Uh, those positions and roles are interlocked in patterned ways, and they too regulate behavior to some degree. We can think of, we hear this term institutions, social institutions, quite a bit. Uh, and the way we use that term in everyday speech it's not quite the way in which it's used technically in the way in which I want to use it. For example, uh, some of you might have heard Texas State San Marcos referred to as an institution. And in everyday speech, that's just fine. That's not what we mean by institutions, though, in a more technical sense. In a more technical sense, institutions define a society. 